is now my great privilege and honor to introduce our commencement speaker, Mr. Anthony Gold. Anthony Gold is a serial entrepreneur, investor, author, advisor, and board member for several companies in the Philadelphia region, both for-profit and non-profit. He began his career designing supercomputers for Unisys, then created an open source software and services startup within the technology giant that was recognized by the industry as the largest open source systems integrator in the world. Anthony was honored to be named one of the top leaders in open source business by Linux World Magazine. He holds eight patents around enterprise hardware and software design, and his ES7000 enterprise server was entered into the Guinness Book of World Records for hosting the largest number of concurrent gamers at the DreamHack Gaming Conference. He subsequently built and ran a healthcare software as a service company focused on connecting patients and caregivers around an ecosystem of collaborative health, partnering with some of the top physicians in the world. With an interest to create more of a startup ecosystem in the Philadelphia suburbs, Anthony launched the Liberty Valley Initiative, a nonprofit for connecting entrepreneurs with mentors, resources, and investors. His latest co-venture is a wearable device tech company called Roar for Good, focused on reducing the incidence of attacks against women and addressing the underlying causes of violence. And in his blog, Anthony's Desk, he shares insights for helping both young professionals and seasoned executives in their careers. Anthony is also a board member of the Penn State Rally Valley Advisory Board. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Anthony Gold. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you to the Board of Trustees, the Board of Advisors, faculty, distinguished guests, family, and friends. Good evening, graduates. I'm going to ask you three questions. Then I'm going to tell you a powerful story that could change your life. And finally, I'm going to give you 10 tips that can help you be a superstar in your professional field. First, the questions. Are you excited to graduate? All right, now let me ask you this. How many of you have landed the job of your dreams, making more money than you ever thought possible, and you're going to be starting there very soon or you're already working there? Be honest. Okay. All right, last question. How many of you would like to be working in a career where you love the work that you're doing, you're compensated extremely well, and you're always continually growing? Okay. Believe it or not, it's not very hard. And I'm going to give you a few tips how. Most of this I learned from many, many mistakes that I made along the way. As you heard from Chancellor Nemes, I started my career designing mainframes at Unisys right there, right next door. And while I love the intellectual stimulation of designing computers, I was especially drawn to the business side and learning how technology could be leveraged to solve really compelling societal challenges. And I was given a great opportunity to create a startup business. And I built a little startup around open source software. And we hit the market at the perfect time and grew that little business to about $300 million in just two years. From there, I was bitten by the entrepreneurial bug, and I built a healthcare company, and now I spend my time investing in startups, primarily those that are focused on trying to change the world. As you heard, Roar for Good is focused on reducing the incidence of attacks against women. My career has been very, very fortunate, but the path was nowhere near as smooth as I just described it. As a matter of fact, it was actually quite rocky. I used to be a very nervous, insecure person. And I worried a lot what other people thought about me. When I got my electrical engineering degree from Drexel, some of my classes there were very difficult. And I never asked a question in any of those classes. And my thinking went like this. If my question were a good question, if it were a smart question, somebody else would have asked it. So it must be a dumb question, and I don't want to ask it. Otherwise, I'll look like an idiot. So I never asked any questions, and I was an idiot. <laughs> I live my life like that 
for many years. I didn't ask questions. I worried what other people thought about me. And I was terrified of interviews, primarily because I was frightened by rejection. As a matter of fact, my first real interview was absolutely horrific. So I interviewed for a very prestigious graduate school in New Jersey. And I actually wanted to study quantum physics. And I got an interview with the associate dean of the department. And I drove to the interview, and I got lost on the way. And this was before the days of cell phones, so I couldn't call to let them know I'd be late. And I didn't have time to pull over and find a pay phone. I finally got there. I was very nervous. And I was probably I was wearing the only suit that I owned at the time. I'm sure it was all wrinkly and smelly by then. I think it was 15 or 20 minutes late. And they ushered me right into the associate dean's office. Didn't have any time to compose myself. They took me right into her office, sat down, and she started right in with the first question. And the question was probably something along the lines of, why do you want to join this university? And I couldn't have been more than 10 or 15 seconds into my answer, and she stopped me. And she said, Anthony, I don't mean to embarrass you, but are you aware that you have a dryer sheet sticking out the bottom of your pant leg? <laughs> sure enough, I had a dryer sheet sticking out the bottom of my pant leg. It was an incredibly, incredibly embarrassing moment. But the funny thing is this. All these years later, and I think about it, so what? A dryer sheet sticking out of my pant leg. But at the time, I was horrified. Why? Because I was so worried about what that other person thought about me and how that would reflect on me. That was the story of my life for many years until this happened, which changed everything. It was Ocean City, Maryland, a summer. Um, I was there for a weekend. And I was walking along the beach, and it was uh, late afternoon. It was actually early evening, and there was no one around. The lifeguards were gone. And I was walking along the edge of the water just by myself, and I heard someone screaming out for help. And I looked out, and sure enough, there was a kid, maybe 10, 11, 12 years old, who was being dragged out to sea by a strong undertow. And I looked around. There's no, no parents anywhere, no lifeguard. As I said, it was, it was getting, you know, it was early evening. And so I did what, what anyone else would do. I dove in and swam out to the kid and grabbed him and tried bringing him back. But there must have been a storm coming or something because the sea was really rough. And the more that I was trying to pull him back, the further the current was pulling us out. And there were several moments where I actually thought, we're not going to make this. We're going to drown. But eventually, somehow, we found a way back to the beach. Both collapsed on the beach out of exhaustion, but we were both fine. <clears throat> and that's not the part that changed my life. It's what happened after that. The local beach patrol heard about this incident and wanted to meet with me. They wanted to understand what happened, and they wanted to know what they could do to improve their emergency response procedures. And so I agreed to meet with them. And in this meeting, they were asking me questions like, what were you thinking when you heard the kids screaming? Was it hard fighting the undertow, swimming back in? Would it have helped if there were, more, if there were any life preservers around? And what other ideas did I have that could help improve their emergency response procedures? And a really strange thing happened during this interview. All of my answers were coming straight from my heart. I wasn't trying to win anyone's approval. I didn't really care what they were thinking. I was simply there to help them improve their emergency response procedures. And they were grateful to have me there. And I realized that up until that moment, I had had a totally different mindset my entire professional life. Whenever I would go on a job interview or a sales call or performance review meeting or anything else like that, my mindset went like this. I'm there to try and impress the other person. And if I do a good enough job, I'll get what I want. The job, the sale, the good performance review, the raise, or whatever. And I had an epiphany. What if I treated all those sorts of encounters the same way as the beach patrol interview? Instead of thinking that the other person had something that I needed, the job, the sale, etc., I realized that it was the other way around, that they need what I have. And I'm simply there to give them a few snippets into how my skills and experiences can help them be more remarkable. This changed everything for me, and it helped me to help other people. Case in point, let me tell you about a woman who wanted to land her dream job with Zynga. Anybody familiar with Zynga? It's the social gaming company that Facebook bought, several billion dollar sale. Anyway, this woman wanted to work there. She was a data analyst um, in Philadelphia, and she was very good at SQL. But before meeting, and she had an interview with Zynga. But before meeting with Zynga, all of her other interviews, she had failed one after another after another. And the reason that she was failing these interviews is because she went into each interview with the mindset of, this company has what I need, the job. And she never made it obvious how, to the interviewers how her skills 
could help the companies. And I asked her this one question. I said to her, as a data analyst, have you ever uncovered any non-obvious conclusions that enabled your company to better serve their customers? And her eyes lit up and she said, oh my goodness, all the time. And I said, great, here's what I want you to do. When you meet with Zynga, I want you to do two things. One, tell them about these conclusions that you drew and how it helped your company. And two, remember that you have what Zynga needs to be more successful. Otherwise, they never would have invited you in for the interview if they didn't believe that. Well, that's exactly what she did. And guess what happened? She got the job. Yep. She landed the job of her dreams at Zynga. She's in California now, making an incredible salary, doing work that she loves. That one mindset shift and the practical tips that I'm about to share enabled me to land every job I ever wanted, make more money than I ever dreamed possible, and accomplish things that could really change the world. So here are those 10 tips. Tip number one, build your own advisory board. Advisory board members are simply people who have accomplished a certain amount of success, whether that be professionally or personally, and they're willing to help others who are eager to follow in their footsteps. These people are great for providing advice, are making introductions and connections, and helping you grow you. And I found that the easiest way to get someone to join your advisory board is simply to ask them. Most people feel very honored to lend their guidance and expertise to someone who is genuinely seeking it. And if they're too arrogant or snobbish to want to be part of your advisory board, guess what? You don't want them anyway. And never stop surrounding yourself with advisors. The people will change over time, but the ability to learn and grow will never end. And a personal advisory board is one of the best ways to provide the impetus to continually grow. Tip number two, find ways that you can help others. Don't just do your job. Go to other departments in your company and find out what challenges they have. If you're an engineer, find out what keeps the people in marketing and HR up at night. You might not have the answers, but if you position yourself as a good listener, you'll probably be able to make some connections to bring in people from outside the organization that can help make a difference. And by continually seeking to help others, great things will flow back to you. I guarantee it. Tip number three, always be connecting. You don't have to be an extrovert to network and connect. You don't even have to have an outgoing, engaging personality to have build an awesome network. Here's the only thing you need to do. Ask people to talk about themselves. That's it. Ask them what they love about their work. Ask them what worries them. Doesn't matter. It turns out that talking about ourselves lights up the same pleasure centers in our brain as do food and money. But even more significantly, we like and we really want to spend more time with the people who get us talking. So be that person who gets other people talking. Be that person who's a good listener. You'll be amazed at what that does for your network regardless of your personality type. Tip number four, accept responsibility for your mistakes and failures. No one is perfect. There will always be roadblocks and times you screw up. And while it's far easier to point the accusing finger at someone else, it's not going to help you much in life. Here's the best way that I found to handle it. First, acknowledge it. I screwed up, and here's how. Next, understand it. Here's what I learned from that experience, and then step three, apply it. Here's how I used that learning in some future situation, and things worked out really well. If you can honestly accept responsibility for your mistakes and apply those learning experiences, you will stand far above your peers. Tip number five, always, always, always negotiate your salary. Whether you're starting a new job or you're getting promoted or transferred from one role to another, negotiate your salary. If you negotiated just your first job starting salary and never negotiated ever again, just that one time, first job starting salary, Sorry, Jim, I probably shouldn't say this. <clears throat> if you negotiated just your starting job's first salary, the compounding effect of that would translate into over $600,000 over your career. $600,000 just negotiating one time. Imagine if you did that for each role. And believe it or not, negotiating is far easier and far less anxiety producing than most people think. Tip number six, develop mechanisms to overcome the imposter syndrome. There's fascinating research that shows that the more skilled that you truly are, 
the less competent you think you are. And conversely, in what's known as the Dunning-Kruger effect, the less skilled you truly are, the more competent you believe you are. <laughs> now, all of you are graduating from one of the finest institutions in the world, so I know you fall into the highly skilled category. So, the best ways that I've found to overcome the imposter syndrome are this. First, recognize that you're doing this to yourself. You can't counteract the effects until you recognize that you're the one who's choosing to listen to this negative voice. Next, look at the assertions. Is it really true that you don't belong, or is it more likely that you're sabotaging your own thought processes? And finally, one tip that has worked wonders for me over my career is this. Maintain a positive reinforcement folder. Anytime someone sends you an email telling you how much you helped them or how much your work made a difference, put that in your positive reinforcement folder or tag it with a positive reinforcement tag. And then anytime you're feeling down, simply go into that folder and read some of those. You will feel a million times better. Tip number seven, learn the victory pose. You'll see it in a minute. If you want to dramatically increase your confidence levels and lower your stress for anything, whether it be an interview, an important speech, a first date, doesn't matter. Doing two minutes of the victory pose will dramatically reduce the amount of cortisol in your blood, that's the stress hormone, and increase testosterone, that's the confidence hormone. This research was done by Amy Cuddy at Harvard, fascinating research, and her TED talk on this topic is the second most popular talk in the world. So what is the victory pose? It's simply this. Put your hands over your head in a V formation, clench your fists, and put on a big smile. <laughs> Trust me, I hold that for a minute or two, and the changes in your physiology are dramatic, and it really, truly works like magic. So you're all about to graduate. Let's see the victory pose. Come on, put it up and smile. And, pa and parents, parents, parents and friends, your kids, your friends are graduating. Come on, let's see the victory pose. Yeah. Feels good, doesn't it? Okay, three more tips. Tip number eight, be true to yourself. In the words of Oscar Wilde, be yourself because everyone else is taken. So I, I read a terrific essay a few years ago by a palliative care worker named Bronnie Ware. And she worked with patients during the last phase of their life. And she wrote this incredibly powerful essay called Regrets of the Dying. And the number one regret of the dying, and, and she, so had she worked with these patients for a number of years, and the number one regret across all of her patients was this. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself and not the life others expected of me. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself and not the life others expected of me. So don't let fear and insecurity hold you back from pursuing your passions. Tip number nine, be kind. You will encounter many different kinds of people over your career. Some will be nice, others nasty. Some will be generous, others stingy. Some will be helpful, others deceitful. But keep this in mind, everyone you meet is struggling to do the best that they can. Some people do that in more socially appropriate ways, other people, not so much. The ancient Greek philosopher Philo said it best, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. If you heed Philo's words, you'll not only better understand human nature, but your own path will be much smoother. And finally, my last tip for helping you lead a spectacularly rewarding career is this. Don't ever have a dryer sheet sticking out the bottom of your <laughs> pant leg. Okay. Actually, we can't, we can't end on that tip. We can't end on that tip. So tip number 10 is really this. Continually read great books. I don't care whether it's fiction or nonfiction. I found that good books can make such a huge impact on professional careers and personal growth. There are many, many books that have moved me over my career. Three that I'll just call out are Getting Things Done by David Allen, which is a phenomenal book on productivity. Yeah, kudos to David Allen, all right. How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, one of the most powerful human interaction books that's out there. And Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, probably one of the greatest books ever written. <clears throat> Even after all these years, 
I'm still amazed by how much a great book can move, motivate, and inspire me to new heights. So to bring this commencement address to an end, please remember this. Every one of you has game-changing skills that can make a difference, both for the companies you work for and the people in your lives. Learning how to articulate, leverage, and apply these skills will change your life. I guarantee it. Now go out there and live your life boldly and without fear. Turn your dreams into reality and make your mark. Congratulations, graduates. You are about to change the world. Thank you.